In this passage in the Gospel of Mark, we have uh, an encounter where Jesus does another exorcism in the Gospel of Mark, but this one's unique. It's a unique exorcism, and in my opinion, the unique elements of it, such as it looks like it's failing while it's happening, it looks like it's not working, uh, that kind of element going on, I think that this unique element shows us the cross. And I know that's like a big claim, and it's like, oh, that's nice. Of course, your pastor, you think it shows us the cross. But I like to build a case for that as we get to that point in the text. That's probably the most exciting part to me is how this, this stubborn demon, is what we'll actually see here, demonstrates the cross of Christ. Uh, we'll get there as we plow through. For right now, here we are. This is uh, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 14. We're going to read right through verse 29. This is part 31 in our continuous series through the Gospel of Mark. Um, I will try to keep it under triple digits for the whole series, probably. No, I'm confident we'll be under that. But, um, but yeah, here we go. Let's, let's read Mark 9, 14. It says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up And he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. All right, let's plow through this verse by verse, try to understand it. This is, of course, I didn't mention this at at our intro here, but this is also the I believe help my unbelief passage that I think is precious to the heart of any Christian who struggled with doubt. You found this verse and went, Ah. Thank you, Lord. That was like salve to my soul. And, uh, and it is. And we'll get there as well. That's also really important is that um, faith is not the absence of doubt, actually, uh, I don't think. Um, and I think this verse supports that. So here we go. Uh, Mark 9, 14. It says, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. The scene, just to back up and remind us, right? Jesus took the disciples, Peter, James, and John, just the three, these three primo guys, right? Took them up onto the mountain and the transfiguration happened. They have this great revelation of the glory of Christ and of really kind of a picture of the first and second coming. Then they come back and they come back and there's a whole scene going on. There's all this stuff that's already happening. Jesus arrives with the three disciples. Well, there's the other nine that are already there and they have failed to cast out this demon and it's caused a a disagreement or an argument. The argument seems to be between the disciples, the nine, who failed to cast out the demon and the scribes. What do you think they're arguing about? Well, we know enough about the scribes at this point in the Gospel of Mark to assume they're saying, you couldn't cast out the demon because you guys are false and your teacher's false and you don't have the approval of the correct religious leadership and you guys are basically, you have no power. That's why you couldn't cast out the demon. Note, however, that they're not casting it out either. So it's not like they're you know, showing their authority over them. Um, so I think it was about how this event shows Jesus must not be who he claims to be or who the disciples are claiming him to be. I think that was the emphasis that was going on here. So uh, verse 15, it says, And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up, ran up to him and greeted him. So that they, they charge forward. The crowd wants to see Jesus. That's kind of who they've come for. They've got these nine disciples whose names they're trying to remember. You know, and then, and then Jesus isn't around. And Peter, James, and John aren't around. Well, they see Jesus, they run up. 
Verse 16, and he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams it and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out. And they were not, they were not able. Notice how he says in the beginning of his thing, I brought my son to you. But obviously Jesus isn't there. He's up on the, the mountain doing the transfiguration stuff. So he says, so I asked your disciples to cast him out and they couldn't do it. Brought him to you. Oh, well, I got your disciples instead. And they couldn't do it. Um, the answer to Jesus's question, though, is really interesting to me because he asks the crowd, what are you arguing about? And it seems as though the father, he just interrupts all that. They're probably arguing about why can't your disciples cast this demon out? But the father's like, wait, Jesus is here. I don't care what you guys are arguing about. I just want help. So he kind of interrupts and hijacks the conversation and he says, help, Jesus, please help. He, this is what triggered the argument, but it's not what the argument was exactly about, I don't think. Um, so the father doesn't care about the argument. He cares about the problem he has. And there's something to be said for the person who cares more about finding help from God than they do about arguing about God. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I like debates and interesting discussions about God and I find them informative and thoughtful and I find them interesting. But there are some people who are only interested in the argument, but they would rather avoid the actual help of God. They just want to argue about him because it gives them some benefit that they perceive. Um, so any, at any rate, here's the diagnosis. The guy says, my son has a spirit. Okay, this is not a euphemism for sickness. Sometimes we use this as a euphemism for sickness in some circles. Like, oh, that person's sick. He's got a spirit of sickness. That person's lazy. They have a spirit of laziness. That person's, you, you name it, they have a spirit of, you name it. Um, this is seeing spirits everywhere. And we have these two extremes, seeing spirits everywhere and seeing spirits nowhere. And these are the two extremes that the Bible would actually probably have us avoid, both of those extremes, and realize it's a reality, but it's not automatic. In this case, it's a spirit. Um, the Gospels do show that spirits, these spirits or these demons are personal beings. Um, sickness, it seems, is merely a symptom. His actual root issue is this demonic spirit that's messing up with this, messing with this boy's life. It, do, uh, do spirits always cause sickness? No, we've seen that in the text of scripture, that the spirits don't always cause sickness. Um, for instance, in 1 Timothy, when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, drink some wine, right? Don't just drink only water, drink wine for your many infirmities. Why isn't, why isn't Paul like, pray that the demon of infirmity would be cast out from you, Timothy? You know, you know he sees that there is a legitimate medical condition going on here. There's no spiritual concern here. Um, Paul also, who had incredible gifts where God would use him to heal massive numbers of people, yet we read that he left Epaphroditus sick in Miletus. He's got one of his ministry partners who he leaves and loses an important ministry partner for a, for a season because he leaves him sick in Miletus and he, the guy almost died. Paul left. Paul, why didn't you stay there and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying until he was healed? Well, because that's not always what you do because... Life is complicated and God has a variety of ways of dealing with our sickness. Sometimes healing it, sometimes not. Sometimes healing it over time. It's just, we got to be more wise than this sort of black and white view. Um, so the symptoms though that of this spiritual demonic possession, the symptoms are, uh, there's a few of them. One, he's mute. Now this is not focused on much um, in the Gospel of Mark. It's mentioned, he's mute, right? There's not like a strong emphasis on it. We don't even hear about the boy talking after this. But we're assuming that he does because Jesus says it was a, a mute demon or a demon that was causing muteness. Mute means he doesn't speak, right? So like when you mute the remote or the, 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 um, the video you're watching. So this is um, not focused on much in Mark and it's actually not even mentioned in Matthew or Luke, the other two accounts that record this, you know, parallel story. It's not mentioned at all. And this is what uh, R.T. France says about this. He sees the casual mention of the muteness as having implications about the historicity of the event. So let me read it to you. R.T. France says, while there's nothing improbable in this combination of problems, it's interesting that neither Matthew nor Luke mentions a speech defect. And Mark's narrative focuses on the epileptic symptoms rather than on the restoration of speech. The fact that the boy was also dumb or mute seems to be one of those irrelevant narrative details which Mark so often preserves, even though it is not where his interest is centered. When you see people preserving irrelevant details, it increases the um, 
credibility of the claims of the, and it, you know, I, I went to the store and man, it was really hard to park that day. And they did that. They're just sort of recollecting things as they actually happened. Whereas when people fabricate stories, they tend to miss those details. So accomplished liars will deliberately put in these sort of irrelevant kind of details to try to make it look more true. But, um, you know, on a fair measuring of reading a document from history, irrelevant kinds of details like that increase the likelihood of its historicity. So it's like just another little checkbox on the historicity side of the Gospel of Mark. This is what happens when you recount a true story. The second symptom, not mute, it's that it occasionally seizes him. The boy gets seized. Uh, sometimes it comes on worse than other times, which means that the, the demonic oppression or demonic impact that's happening in this boy's life, it's just, it's occasionally worse than it is at other times. I think that's just an interesting thing. Some, he's, he's sort of constantly afflicted in some respect, but it sometimes comes on much worse than others. And then the third one, or three, I'll just group a few together. He foams, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. This is like what happens when it comes upon him. Uh, there's a little more insight that we get from the context. In verse 22, it says, It has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. So that when these attacks come, they don't just come randomly. They seem to come at times when an attack would be especially dangerous. As though the demon's looking for opportunity to try to harm the boy. Or he can do a certain amount of harm that might lead to even greater harm. That's the idea, right? Thrown into fire, thrown into water to kill him. Matthew 17, 15 affirms this as well. It says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for um, he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And so the statement is that he's falling into fire and water. It's, it's often a life-threatening thing. This to me, and I want to be careful how I say this, but it seems to me there's a consistent, or at least semi-consistent feature of demonic effects is that it's causing self-harm. That self-harm, you know, for no apparent reason, might have some sort of demonic connection. Might, not does. Might. Catch that. I said might. You guys understand nuance, so <laughs> you do. But, but I'm worried about you guys on the internet sometimes. Uh, so we'll see. Verse 22 and then Matthew 17, 15 seem to indicate this. Um, it, earlier in Mark, the demoniac who is cutting himself, he cut himself. He would often cut himself, the guy that had all the demons in him. Then we have Judas. After Satan enters him, he betrays Jesus. And the next thing he does is he goes and commits suicide. There's another self-harm. Uh, so I'm just saying perhaps uh, unexplained intuitions towards self-harm or, or the self-harm activity of those who seem to be manifesting some symptoms of possession or demonic oppression might be another indicator that this is in fact demonic because it's directed towards self-harm. But I don't want to assume anything. Um, it does seem that demonic influence was at a particularly high point during the ministry of Jesus. And that we don't look at the ministry of Jesus to see a pattern for how often we see demonic possession in our lives. In fact, most of us probably see it very rarely, if ever. Right? You can, have, you can count on one hand the kind of crazy experiences you've seen in your life where you thought that was probably something demonic going on there. So that seems to be the norm. In fact, as we go through the book of Acts, we see it's different than the Gospels in that the demonic events and things are, are lessened. They're greatly uh, de decreased. And so there's a sort of spike in the ministry of Jesus. We don't look to see that replicated in every ministry or every life around the world. So here's some things we learn. Here's some things we learn. Demonic affliction is not one size fits all. It's not one size fits all. We see a variety of different uh, symptoms and activities going on in people's lives. Um, it can manifest in physical symptoms. It can manifest in physical symptoms, but it doesn't necessarily have to, but it can. Um, it's, it's not, however, the only cause of those symptoms. Demon possession is actually distinguished from epileptic seizures in other places in the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, listen to this list. It's, it's demonic possession on one side, epilepsy on another side. It says, um, the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, that's possessed people, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So they're not grouped together. They're not, if it's paralysis or if it's epilepsy, then it's automatically demonic. So we see that it can, they can cause that, but there's also other causes. I just think that we can avoid those two extremes. The two extremes of it's never demons and it's always demons. These are both unwise. 
They're both unwise. We do live in a world that has that sort of that spiritual realm going on, interacting with us at all times. And we should be careful and be thoughtful about it without being fearful. We should be aware that it's a real thing. Okay, so that's the man. He comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, help me, please. This is what's going on with my son. Let's look at Jesus's answer. It's kind of shocking. It's not what you'd expect. This is one of those moments where modern sensibilities would say, Jesus, you're not acting like Jesus, right? Because frequently he doesn't act like the kid gloves version of Jesus. Jesus, full of compassion, but sometimes harsh with his words, okay? That's the reality of him. Verse 19, it says, he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. First question I have is, who is the faithless generation? Who's he talking about here? Um, I think it's all of them. I think there's three kind of groups of people here, and they all are demonstrating lack of faith. <clears throat> there is the scribes who want to not believe, and they're looking for excuses to justify their unbelief. That's kind of the perspective. That's why they're arguing. Ha, he didn't heal this one thing. God didn't heal this thing over here. That means that, that you're wrong about God. Then there's the disciples, perhaps because of weakness of the flesh, perhaps, perhaps because of some other problem going on. Whatever it is, there seems to be an, a, an actual faith issue going on with the disciples in some regard. They're with Jesus. They believe Jesus in one sense, but perhaps they don't have confidence in his power uh, like they should. Uh, perhaps they don't have confidence in their access to God or God's care for the situation. I don't know. Because previously, these same disciples had gone out towns away from Jesus' presence two by two, and they had cast out demons. But this seems to be particularly difficult, and it seems to require a particularly strong faith. And, or I shouldn't say strong faith, but it seems like, like their faith is more of an issue in this scenario than it was previously when they were casting out demons. There's something different about what's going on here. The father himself might be a victim of a faithless generation situation here. As he's like, if you can, if you can, I don't know for sure if you can, I'm just looking for help. It's kind of a long shot. He's doing a Hail Mary <laughs> to Jesus, to forgive the expression. <clears throat> I do think, though, that we see um, Jesus as being so happy to hang out with sinners that we don't realize that that's not the whole story. Now, I'm including myself in the category of sinners here, okay? This isn't the sinners isn't the other. That's another thing Jesus shows us. Is sinners is the us. It's not just the other. It's all of us. But I don't think he was so elated and so chill and so cool and non-judgmental that he would just chill with anybody. and They could be like sitting in front of him and he was like, ha ha, bro, I love you, man. I just love you so much. I don't even care. Like, I don't think that that's the real biblical Jesus here. Here's Jesus giving us a, a little glimpse behind the curtain and he straight up says, like, it irritates me to have to be around you. How long do I have to bear with you? Well, Mike, that's just a pure expression. Like, well, no, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's a sense of frustration. I think if I read it plainly, just read the text as it's presenting itself. How long? In Matthew 17, 17, it adds this word, perverse. How long shall I have to bear with you, you faithless and perverse generation? You people are wicked. You're messed up. You don't get it. It's, it's, it's somewhat a little tough for me to be around you. Jesus. You're not acting like Jesus, Jesus. You're supposed to go to people and you're supposed to say to them, I think you're amazing. I think you're amazing. I'm so proud of you. You're so, you're so amazing. I just, I just, I want to be around you so much. All I want to do is be around you. You're such a, you're, I'm lonely without you. Here, it's just like the opposite of this, meaning that we're not getting the whole picture in our sort of modern sort of, um, I don't know, life coach version of Jesus, you know, where it's, he's just so affirming of us. Don't get me wrong. His love is, is, is solid. It's in place. It's there. But that's not the only dimension we need to consider. Consider this. It was because of love and because of patience that Jesus was bearing with them, even though their sinful presence was unpleasant to him in some regard. He tolerated them in love. Now, if you think Jesus is self-righteous, then I would say, well, I mean, he is righteous. So he is self, he's literally self-righteous in the non-hypocritical sense. He is righteous in and of himself. And so, of course, he has a different difficulty. You might be thinking this is about you and how hard it is for you to tolerate sinners. I'm like, this isn't actually about you or me, right? 
it's not about me and how hard it is for me to tolerate sinners. Like, no, I'm, I'm one of them, okay? This is, this is the thing. God's patient towards us in that in our constant trials and constant struggles and constant sinful behaviors, he still tolerates us. And he's like, how long am I going to have to bear with you? But he's willing to bear with us. But let's not act like that it isn't without some, uh, some cost on his own. You could say he tolerates them in love. God always has tolerated us in love. It's the reason why the world still exists. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. It's a tolerance thing. God is, is the original preacher of tolerance. It's why, real tolerance, not, not modern confusion about the topic, but actual tolerance where it's like, yep, disagree with you. Yep, you're messed up, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be loving towards you, giving us time, time to come to him. So he's always tolerated the world, but it's not limited to the world. His own disciples seem to be included in this. Ugh, it's tough to be around you guys. <laughs> That's, his disciples seem to be included in this. Um, it's in response to, hey, I asked your disciples to cast out the demon, but they couldn't. And then his next thing is, ugh. I am really grateful for God's patience with me. When I think about this, I'm like, just imagine the thoughts and behaviors that I have done in the past month that have displeased the Lord, that have been difficult in some sense uh, for him to be around. And that he tolerates me, his incredible patience, his incredible love, waiting on my very slow sanctification as I slowly become more godly. And in some cases, I've become less godly. I'm just amazed by his patience, amazed by it. And I think we shouldn't take it for granted is the whole thing. I'm not deserving I'm just loved. I don't deserve it. I'm, I just am loved. It's the natural thing of kids to think that they're owed whatever their parents give them. Have you noticed, like, we do this, I do this when I was a kid, right? Whatever they give me, that's what I'm owed. Whatever, you know? Like when my birthday comes around, I'm owed presents. It's my birthday. I'm owed presents. And we can be, treat, take this kind of... Uh, in gratitude towards the Lord and his patience with us and his perseverance, like waiting on us and all of our constant issues. And you're going to have them until you go to be with him, until you're rid of this flesh. Finally, you're going to continue to have these issues. And then heaven, the glorious thing is that heaven is going to be this situation, eternity, right? Whether that's our temporary in his presence or if it's finally when heaven meets earth and the recreation of all things, there's not going to be any of this tolerance because we will be fully sanctified, fully I mean, in his presence, there'll be no, no one's going to tolerate anybody at that point. Not like that. Not, not tolerating sin. It's going to be glorious, finally. For now, he's bearing with me. Our current culture feels a need to be worthy and to have self-assurance and to feel like they're good people. Um, that, that sense of need, uh, perhaps it's because you want to feel good about yourself, which I understand. I want to feel good about myself, too, but... There's a, there's a sober reality when you look at yourself and you look at your heart and you look at your mind and you hold that up to God's actual moral standard and you go, yeah, he just tolerates me a lot. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on. It's not that I'm good. It's that I'm loved. It's that I'm greatly loved. Because thinking you have to be feeling good about yourself, I think it can cause either arrogance or blindness, right? Arrogance because you think you are good. Blindness because you're blind to your actual issues. I think it can cause those kinds of things. If you do happen to see through those issues and you see that you have problems, it causes great distress because you think you have to commend yourself to God by your goodness. And you have all kinds of distress. I can't pray. I can't seek the Lord. I, I, I can't go to church. The roof will fall in on me. Um, those kinds of things. And you're like, well, you don't understand God's grace, uh, God's kindness. So I say, let it go. Just be loved. Just be appreciative. Just be grateful. That's our job is to say thank you for his incredible patience and love for us. All right, verse 20, it says, and they brought the boy to him. And the, when the spirit saw him, something happens when the spirit sees Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. I think that this demon knows that it cannot resist Jesus, but it has a different reaction than other demons. And there are other places, uh, you know, they come and they bow before Jesus and they're like, oh, please don't, you know, cast us out before our time. And they, they're like worshiping. You know, I know who you are. You're the son of God. This one, it attacks the boy. It convulses him, perhaps to keep him from coming. Um, whatever the reason is, I don't know. I do think, though, that this indicates demons have a greater awareness of who Jesus is than we do in many cases. They're walking up to Jesus. And they're like, oh, it's Jesus. Let's go see you. And the demon sees him. Ah, freaks out appropriately, right? As James says, the demons believe and tremble. This was kind of a literal 
<laughs> experience of that, believe in Trimble. Um, my own limited experience in dealing with people who are caught up in the demonic is that they do react to the name of Jesus. Um, I remember talking to a one uh, teenager who was doing all kinds of weird things. And when we were discussing things, I just mentioned the name Jesus and he took a visible step backwards. I didn't mention it religiously. I was just talking about God to him, you know, and, and I didn't say anything. I said it again in conversation and he takes a step back again. And um, there was just, there was more of a spiritual awareness on his part, tampering with evil things than there was perhaps even sometimes in the hearts of Christians when they're praying in Jesus' name. So it's good just to be aware. Verse 21, it says, uh, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And then your heart sinks. You're like, oh, this is, this, it's a little boy. It's like a little kid. And this is not normal. This is not like a typical thing that happens. This is like totally abnormal. It's the only time we see something like this, really, um, that I'm aware of. And I don't know what the cause is, and we're not given any indication as to why. He just seems innocent. He just seems like some innocent boy, you know, like hasn't done something to bring this on him in particular. But let's keep that in mind, because I think that that weighs in on what we're learning from this story. Re remember how bothersome it is that it's this little boy that's being affected. Verse 22, and it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, <laughs> like, if I can do something, all things are possible for one who believes. Um, earlier in Mark, in Mark chapter one, verse 40, there was a leper who said to Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. He's, he's, he's just asking if you're willing to heal me or not. It's a if you will thing. This is different. This is if you can. And it is a shocking idea because of who Jesus is. Jesus knows who he is. And he's like, if, if I can. And so he kind of rhetorically bluntly puts it back to him. If I can, he's pointing out the faith issue that's going on here. You're not trusting me. Faith is essential. But then when we get to verses like this, we come up to some questions like, um, does that mean that if I just have enough faith, I can make anything happen. Anything. And if you take Jesus' words, you might think that. If you take them out of context. out of And that is out of context. I'd like to put them in context for us. Jesus here says, all things are possible for one who believes. Implication? Anything will happen, right? If I just have enough faith, I just have to stir up that faith. Now, faith is an important factor in prayer. We don't want to diminish that, but but I don't want to misunderstand it either. In fact, I would say that this man's faith was never super strong. He believed, but he had unbelief at the same time. And Jesus still heals. Jesus still heals with unbelief mixed in with belief, which means it's not about this strong, super strong faith that he builds up. It was just about choosing to trust Christ, the simplicity of faith. When Jesus talks later about having enough faith, he talks about having a mustard seed. You have a mustard seed of faith. In other words, it's not about how much you have, you just have to have it. You have to choose faith. That's important. But also, it's not as though anything without qualification is going to happen if you believe God for it. I don't think that's the case. Scripture qualifies it. Let me give you in Mark where he qualifies it. There's another place where Jesus uses the phrase, all things are possible. All things are possible. Well, it's in Mark 14, verses 35 and 36. Listen to how Jesus prays. He knows all things are possible. He believes, right? It says, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. And he was saying, and listen to his prayer, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. That would be a faith-filled prayer submitted to God's will. Now, I've heard prosperity style preachers or health and wealth kind of preachers mostly health preachers, I guess, nowadays. Some of the wealth ones do it too, but sometimes they shy away from talking about wealth because it just looks so bad on them. <laughs> um, but the health preachers, and they'll say, don't pray if you are willing, God. Yet we have multiple examples in scripture of this, and we have an example from Jesus, from Jesus himself. And he says, yet not what I, not what I will, but what you will. So I, I think that we have a good sample there that faith is essential, it's super important, you must have it, but it's not a guaranteed result because God's will is what we're asking for here. His plan, his purposes yield, yielded to his will. 
Verse 24, it says, Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And to me, this is such an important verse. I remember years ago when I sort of discovered it. I know I had read it before, but when I discovered it in the middle of my own trial of doubt, having lots of questions that I, I didn't have answers to yet, and nobody I knew had answers to them. I didn't even want to ask them the questions I was questioning about because I thought they've never even thought about this and it's just going to mess them up. I remember going through all that and, you know, yeah, I ended up finding answers. It took a while. <laughs> found some answers. <laughs> found good answers. Took a while. Took some work. Had to look for the answers. But man, this, this scripture was so important to me. I believe helped my unbelief. This means that faith is not always without doubt or unbelief. That belief is not <laughs> the absence of all unbelief or all feelings of unbelief. Now, I like certainty, but there is sort of an unhealthy commitment to having certainty that a lot of Christians have. Some Christians have incredible confidence. They, they, there's like no wavering of any kind, and that's ideal. I want that. Um, I don't want to demonize that or, or, or act like that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. But it's not a necessary thing. That's all I'm saying. It is not necessary that every Christian have 100% total confidence and certainty. It's not necessary for you to be a Christian, to have that. But when Christians who feel that incredible confidence, when they encounter believers who are doubting, it, it doesn't make sense to them. And that's fine. Maybe they're more spiritually clear-minded about this. Maybe it's the one who's doubting that's got all kinds of fog going on and confusion and things like that. But still, we can have compassion on people who are doubting. And we can say, hey, you don't have to have certainty to believe in Jesus. What? That's right. You don't have to have certainty to believe in Jesus. Although, ideally, you have a very high degree of certainty. It's not required. In all honesty, I think you can be a Christian if you just feel like you've got better reason to trust in Christ than you do not trust in Christ. You may have questions and unanswered issues that go both ways, but you decide, I will trust in you, Lord. It's that decision to trust him, that's where faith comes in. It doesn't mean it's blind. No, you have reasons for it, sure. Good reasons for it. But it doesn't mean you have to answer every question. There is this thing where some believers, they think, if I can't answer every single apologetic question, then I can't really have confidence in Christ. If I don't know how to prove the exodus really happened, then I can't have confidence in Christ. If I don't know how to prove that Paul really wrote, uh, you know, whatever, the, the book of uh, Philemon, then I can't have confidence in Christ. If I don't know how to show that the New Testament hasn't been changed over time, then I can't have confidence. And it's, it's weird because it, and, and then skeptics take advantage of this. In fact, skeptics, some, some of them are skeptics because they felt that way, right? And so then they come and they'll take advantage of this, this you know, I think unwise thinking, um, not really entirely rational thinking, by, by hitting Christians with questions. What about, what about, what about, what about, what about, what about? And then forget all the questions you can answer. Let's just find one or two you can't answer that you don't know the answer to. And now let's try to imply that you should abandon your faith in Christ, um, rethink your, your commitment to Christ because of it. Over the years, I, I was that guy who felt like I had to answer every question. And after a while, I was like, this is like monumentally unwise. I mean, I don't know how to answer every question about anything. That doesn't mean I can't believe anything. I mean, if, if that's my bar for belief in things, then I'm going to be a very unstable individual. Now, skeptics sometimes get out of this by only setting the bar that high when it comes to God and religion. And then they set the bar really low when it comes to other topics in life. So they can sort of maintain uh, what they feel is rational unbelief along with being able to accept lesser evidence for other things. Um, and that's, that's kind of where the argument goes. It's like, well, what kind of evidence do you need? Extraordinary evidence, by which who knows what people mean by extraordinary evidence. It's kind of a nonsense term. All I need is better reason to believe than to disbelieve. And even if all you have is the testimony of the work of, the, of God in your life, that is, that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Let's see, I know God changed my life and I really feel like I'm in a relationship with Christ. And like, why is that not a good reason to trust in him? Uh, now, now, over time, I've walked through my checklist and I've, I've, I've demonstrated for myself, my own, to my satisfaction, that the Bible's inspired of God, that it has been delivered to us faithfully over the years, that there is actually fulfilled prophecy, that Jesus really is the Messiah, that he really did rise again. And I've checked off all these boxes I didn't want to know how to check off. But in my pursuit of apologetics, I also realized that there was this bad um, epistemology, we'll call it, that's like how you 
how you know what's know what you know kind of thing. This bad view of how to learn things, how to know things are true, that was hiding behind my pursuit of apologetics. That was this idea that I had to prove everything to believe anything. Like you have to prove um, that the flood was global to believe in Jesus. I want you to imagine how hard of a bar this is for average Christians. Because most of us are completely unequipped to even discuss those type of topics. How much do you understand about plate tectonics? Just please spit it out for me. <laughs> and I'm supposed to like have a debate about plate tectonics to believe in Jesus? It's, it's fine to say, I just don't know the answer here, but I have good reasons to trust in Christ. I don't have to answer every question. I think that's a healthy position to be in. Doesn't mean we don't need to have good reasons for our faith. We have to have good reasons for our faith. We do. It just means I don't have to answer every potential question to believe in Christ. I just have to have good reasons. So I personally have had varying degrees of certainty. Um, plus there's issues of psychological doubt versus intellectual doubt. Uh, intellectual doubt, I would, I would class these as like an actual reason to disbelieve, right? Um, intellectual doubt is like there's all this evidence against some core doctrine of my faith. Okay, there's a lot of good evidence to say Jesus didn't rise. That would be intellectual doubt. Uh, there, I don't think there is any good evidence, but let's suppose there was. That'd be intellectual doubt. Um, psychological doubt's more like this. I know I have all these good reasons to believe in the resurrection, Jesus, but what if I'm wrong? What if? That's psychological doubt. Psychological doubt and these, the, the what ifs fears are not healthy for human beings in any area of your life. Any area of your life. We... We just, we, we can't fight them with intellectual answers anyways, right? Because no matter what good reasons you have to think that such and such won't happen or such and such isn't the case, psychological doubt doesn't care about those reasons. It's just sort of fear sitting upon you. If you're experiencing psychological doubt, that's when steps of faith are required. Obedience to Christ in your life, pursuing the Lord and being patient and waiting on God and to know that you can unbelieve and believe at the same time and Christ will embrace you. That's my, my psychological fears and doubts, but I do choose to trust you, Lord. If it's intellectual doubt, you take the core issues that matter, you sift through what really matters, find the issues, chase it down, study it, do the research, find the answers, and that will help the intellectual side. Um, so yeah. So anyways, I love this. Uh, help my, I believe help my unbelief. I think it's great encouragement to those who are struggling with psychological, emotional doubt, or even some intellectual doubt is, Lord, I'm struggling right now, but I'm choosing to trust you. And Jesus does receive you because what does he do next? He heals the boy. He heals him, meaning this is acceptable faith. Verse 25, and when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, uh, they're drawn by the return of Jesus, um, and them running together triggers Jesus to heal the boy. Okay, he's going to do it quickly, maybe to avoid the whole crowd cramming in first, perhaps. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, and notice this, this is the weird part. Jesus commands the spirit and then he doesn't come out immediately. Cries out and convulses the boy terribly. It, then it comes out and the boy's like a corpse. So that most of them said, he's dead. Keep that in mind. Verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So I see this exorcism. Although I don't know if this is actually the right term to use for this. But I see it as um, in two stages. One, it's the removal of the spirit. And two, it's the restoration of the, bo of the boy. There's first the removal of the spirit, then the restoration of the boy. It happens in sort of two stages, which is unique. This is very different. Uh, we don't see this with the other accounts. When the, when the spirit's removed, it's permanent. Jesus is like, and never enter him again. It's permanent. In this case, as opposed to other ones where he warns someone, hey, don't you know, sin no more lest a worse thing happen to you. Or he talks about a demon being cast out, but then it might potentially come back. Not in this case. Nope, it's just permanent. It's over now. It's all over. Jesus here was different than the culture around them. Uh, Craig Keener talks about the exorcisms of the Jews of the time. It says, exorcists usually tried to subdue demons by incantations, invoking higher spirits, by using smelly roots, or by pain compliance techniques. These are, the, these are the ways they would do it. Jesus here uses only his command, showing his great authority. This is counter the culture. So this is the thing they would have noticed when they saw Christ just command this demon out and that's it. It has to go. 
Which brings up a question. Is it right to call Jesus an exorcist? He's often called an exorcist by people in like literature and stuff. Um, the word is used of some Jewish exorcists in the book of Acts, but in the Bible, Jesus is never actually called an exorcist. And possibly this is because exorcism implies a ritual like what they would go through to get to try to get a demon out. They would do like a whole procedure of some kind. That's an exorcism. There was an exorcism. So there's gathered incantations, invoking higher spirits, smelly roots. Smelly roots. I wonder which roots. I don't want to know what roots they <laughs> I don't even want to know. Anyway, these types of things, pain compliance, which sounds horrible. Sounds like torturing the person. Um Jesus just commands him out. So there's no ritual involved with Jesus. It's, it's purely his authority. Now, we need both of these things. We need the removal of, this, of, the, of the demonic, and we need the restoration of our bodies. We, we need both of these things uh, in our lives as well. Deliverance from Satan and the restoration to life in Christ. I think we need both of those things. An interesting thing there. But now I want to share some parallels, because here's where I see I think the gospel is tied into this story. I think here we are in the heart of the gospel of Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, right here at the heart, chapter 8, chapter 9, it's about the death and resurrection of Christ. It is focused like a laser on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And here in the heart of the Gospel of Mark, focused on the death and resurrection, we have a random statement, random story about an exorcism after Jesus has performed a bunch. But there are some unique elements here that do seem to relate to even Jesus' death and resurrection. So let's talk about those parallels. And the way I think we can get our head wrapped around this is think about it from the disciples' experience. Think if you were one of the disciples and you were there, one of the nine. You had already cast out demons, but this guy shows up, Jesus is up on the mountain doing something with somebody, he's doing stuff, right? And you can't do it, and you're embarrassed. And then the scribes and the fair, the scribes at least come, and they're like trying to say that, see, you guys are wrong, and your failure is proving that you're wrong, and now you're doubting, to the point where Jesus calls you part of this faithless and perverse generation. So they could not help the boy. They couldn't help the boy, just like they couldn't stop the cross. I think the boy here is similar to Jesus. They couldn't stop the cross. They couldn't help the boy. They couldn't stop the affliction from what was happening. They see this as an insurmountable problem, just as they saw the cross as an insurmountable problem. They fled, they were despondent, they lost faith. Jesus shows up, and the disciples are there, and they're thinking, Maybe Jesus can do this. Maybe he can't. We tried to heal. We did it in his name and nothing happened. Maybe he can. Maybe he can't. So they perhaps don't have faith for this particular event. That's what's implied. The disciples don't have faith for this particular event, just like they didn't have faith for the death and resurrection of Christ. It was after he rose, their faith was restored, but not at the time. When Jesus approaches, the problem gets worse, right? He approaches the demons, sees Jesus and starts freaking out. This doesn't look good to them. They're thinking, see, this is, it's getting worse instead of better. This isn't typical for the demons. They don't act up like this generally. When Jesus commands the spirit to come out, it gets even worse. Now think about this. Jesus finally says, okay, come out of him. And now they're watching to see, okay, it's gonna, is it going to work? And the boy shakes even worse, falls down, and then he looks like he's dead. And most of the people there think he is dead. What message does this send about Jesus? He failed. That would be the impression. This is, this is at the moment, you're, now we know the whole story, so we, we just, we like, read right past that. But I think they're thinking, it looks like he's failing. This is a unique element in the story. It's unlike any exorcism that we read about. The boy, not only does it look perhaps like a failure, but the, the boy looks like he's dead. This was like a dramatic pause. There was some sort of moment of time where they were thinking the boy's dead. They're discussing it. They're like, I think he's dead. Jesus is letting this play out. I think they would have thought their worst fears are confirmed. The demon might have won. And after the cross, this is exactly what it looked like. Here's Jesus. He goes to the cross. The forces of darkness coming against him. And there they are. They're kind of like thinking, this isn't going to, he's not going to make it. But maybe he will. And they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And he dies on the cross. And they're like, he's dead. It's over. It's over. He's dead. We've lost our hope. The next thing that happens, verse 27, Jesus holds his hand out. And it says, and the boy arose. What happened after Jesus died on the cross? He arose. I think this might be a parallel to the death and resurrection of Christ. In some cases, it's sin no more. Um, but no, no, here it's permanent. It's like, boom, that's it. End of story. The battle with that demon is permanently over. And just like the death and resurrection of, of Christ was the permanent victory over Satan, over the forces of darkness as well. 
I know that it bothers me when I read about this little boy having a possession because he seems so innocent. And now I can see how that could be a parallel to Christ because here he is innocently suffering, innocently suffering the results of our fall, the results of our failures, the results of our sins. Now, I do think that this is actually a step-by-step, you know, put there by the Holy Spirit meant to look like the cross, meant to picture the cross. It fits in that place in the Gospel of Mark. There's multiple things in the past two chapters that have been eight and nine that are all about the cross and the death and resurrection of Christ. Then we also have the uh, the unique elements of this, resurre- of this um, exorcism or the casting out of this demon. The unique elements themselves are the things that lend towards this sort of analogy to the cross. This makes me feel it's intentional by the Holy Spirit, but there's one more element I'll mention, and that is that this may reflect another Markan sandwich. We've been talking about sandwiches in the Gospel of Mark. That is right where there's like a <clears throat> there's like a story that starts, and then there's like something that interrupts it, and then there's a story that finishes. Well, in chapter 9, verse 12, Jesus asks his disciples, How is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? And they're struggling with this, like, he's going to die, he's going to rise. Like, how do we, is, is this an analogy? Like, they don't understand how this will work because they're thinking it just can't happen. Then after this story, the very next thing that happens, verses 30 through 32, Jesus again tells them he's going to die and rise again. So there's the sandwiching device is those two phrases, verse 12 and then verse 30 through 32. And in the middle, you have this apparent, what looks like a failure, but is actually a great victory. And it's matched with the disciples lacking faith and all these elements that look just like the death and resurrection of Jesus, in my opinion. I don't know why else this story would be here. Why is this a random exorcism here in the middle of Mark 9? If it's not about that, I, don't, I, I couldn't figure out a reason. Um, this is where Mark turns to the cross, and where belief in the cross is asked for and rejected by the disciples, at least temporarily. <clears throat> all right, let's finish the story, verse 28. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, in some translations, it's going to say prayer and fasting. Um, I don't know the right uh, rendering here. This is a textual issue. In some manuscripts, it has and fasting, and in other manuscripts, it does not. Basically, in a couple very, like, highly respected manuscripts, it just says prayer, and it doesn't say and fasting. But these are very highly respected manuscripts, and in both of them, Um, It doesn't have this phrase fasting. But in the majority of other manuscripts, a large majority, it's and fasting. And so there's like a discussion, a debate on whether or not prayer and fasting belongs in. I think the majority believe it doesn't belong, which is why it's reflected that way in in this translation. Um, um, So yeah, this is one of those textual ones where I don't know the right answer. This is one of those places where the right text is either in the text or it's in the footnote. You'll see a footnote in your Bible that'll say, some manuscripts say and fasting. Um, or most manuscripts. And so here's where you're like, it's not like, do we have the word of God? It's more like, which one of these is correct? We don't know. It's between these two options. I'm not sure. Um, and I don't have the, the, uh, the conclusion there. But I do think that the application is probably going to be about the same, which is to say, they obviously tried prayer in some sense. We tried to cast out this demon. It's like they did it without praying. Hey, get out. Like, I mean, obviously, they've done this before. They've done these things before. There's something unique about this particular demon. It seems to be a different kind of demon. In fact, Jesus says this kind does not come out except by prayer. Well, this would imply this is a different, stronger, more stubborn, more difficult, demonic thing, which means that demons are not all just totally identical. There are different strengths, just like with humans. We have different degrees of power and strength. Like, I'm like 9 out of 10. Most of you guys are like a 6. Sorry, I can't help it. Um, if those online, they were all laughing hysterically. You just can't hear them on the microphone. Don't laugh now. Now they know. Um, yeah, so different demons, they're, they're not all identical. Um, but the application, I think, is simple. It's that prayer as a discipline gives us, does provide us with greater strength to deal with bigger issues in life. More powerful demons or, or just struggles that we're going through, harder things we're going through, that prayer not only as something you do, but as a discipline. I think that's the emphasis here, my opinion. Prayer is a discipline. I think that it's good for us to remind ourselves that prayer is supposed to be a discipline. Something we do regularly, something we do intentionally, something we do and we plan, and then we engage in uh, on purpose. Prayer is powerful, 
And continuous prayer is also powerful. Let me close with this example. In Acts 12, we read about Peter who is put into prison, right? The, 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 um, uh, the other church members, leaders, and stuff gathered together and they were praying continually for him. Verse, uh, Acts 12, 5, it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing for, of the church in, uh, unto God for him. So they're praying continually. It's a regular, ongoing, continual prayer. And this is interesting because this is your prayer combined with some degree of doubt, I think. Let me read to you why. Acts 12, verses 12, verse 12 through 16 says, And when he realized this, this is after Peter realizes he's been set free, because an angel sets him free, he thinks he's dreaming or something, and he's like, wait a minute, this is real. So it says, He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, and uh, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. Like he's in prison. Like here they are praying, right? It seems. Lord, please get Peter out of this. He's there. Hey, it's me. He's there. I hear him. It's his voice. No, you're crazy, Rhoda. You're like, you guys know Rhoda. She's a little, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I don't know what was going on. But at any point, they don't immediately believe it. They don't even think, let's get up and check, right? They just dismiss her offhand. Then, um, they said to her, you're out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. They were amazed. I think this is perhaps an example of this kind of thing where, again, we get belief and unbelief kind of mixing together, but the important thing for a, a faithfully praying Christian, even if they're struggling with things, to continue in that discipline of prayer, and it has a big impact not only against a, de a demon, but against whatever the things are that are going on. We still pray for God's will. We still wait on him and his answers. We don't control things. He does, thank God. But the discipline of prayer is important. It's a good reminder for us. So let's pray. Lord, we yield to your will. We yield to your control. We yield to your sovereignty and authority in our lives. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. But now we pray. We pray for the nation around us. We pray for Christians around us in particular right now, Lord. We lift up the church, that the church would be calm, faith-filled, reasonable, and really wise. We pray, Lord, that we would be wise. People who don't respond to uh, gossip, but who respond to what's really going on around us with great wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you would give us that awareness when we're struggling with any of us who might be struggling with doubt, that there is, there is the ability to choose to trust God in the midst of those types of trials and that it is, you respond to it, Lord. It's enough. It's enough. Just like that man, when he believed and didn't believe at the same time, it was enough. So grateful, Lord, that you meet us there in our weaknesses, in our confusion, in our hard times. Lord, we pray that you be glorified in our lives and that you would remind us, even uh, moving forward after tonight, after this, uh, this time in your word, that you remind us about prayer, the, the essential nature of being in prayer on a regular basis, lest we come to trials that we're not equipped to handle because of our lack of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.